<clears throat> Arthur, go for it. Okay, welcome everyone to the uh, first betrayal uh, Skype feature film screenplay read. Um, we really appreciate everybody's time, and um, we don't have a lot of time, so let's. I think we, we're going to get right into it. We've already been assigned our roles, and um, let's have some fun. Thanks, Arthur. Hi, this is Mike Messier. Myself and Arthur Hugh came together uh, through a friend of ours, uh, Joe Jaffo Carrieri, over the years to write this screenplay. Uh, we have a very talented group of people, many from New England, uh, some from across the world, uh, Los Angeles and other places are represented. I'm here in uh, beautiful Jacksonville, Florida. I want to thank everyone that's part of this uh, script read. And uh, right now we present to you a feature film screenplay reading of The First Betrayal by Arthur Hugh and Mike Messier. Fade in, exterior town square, dusk, text on screen, Marina, Egypt, 1967. Several establishing shots of the beautiful small town. The streets are quiet, except for a distinguished Greek military man, Aristos, 35, wearing his uniform and carrying a briefcase. Aristos walks by a series of small cafes and restaurants, but sees that most of them are closed or are in the process of closing. He is hungry and in search of company. From the shadows behind a building emerges Constantine, here at 50. Constantine is dressed in a more modern 2020s custom fit suit and appears highly invested in Aristos's actions. Aristos does not notice Constantine following him. Aristos continues to stroll through the village, observing the shops, all the while looking for a welcoming place to eat. Aristos notices a beautiful young woman, Hanish, only 20, through the class wall of a small family restaurant called Bastet, Egyptian cat goddess. Hanish is clearly several tables is clearing several tables by herself as the waitress with her hair pulled up tight and hidden behind a scarf and while wearing no makeup hanisha's face still radiates through her hard work aristos freezes outside and watches her work after a few moments hanish feels herself being watched and returns his gaze they share a moment aristos smiles at hanish she returns the smile then he frowns she responds with her own frown their game continues. Still outside, Constantine watches this from a distance. Then he turns to address us in a seductive whisper, as if, as if letting us in on a secret. Everybody's got a story. This one is mine. Young love. I'm sorry, I cut you off. Go ahead. Everybody's got a story. This one is mine. Young love. Interior, Bastille restaurant, night. Hanish is inside, continuing her flirtation with Aristos through the glass window until her boss, Bastet owner, comes over and admonishes her. Back to work, Hanish. We don't pay you to play games. Hanish crumbles while being yelled at. Yes, well, sorry. We'll throw you out without any pay if you continue this nonsense. No, please. I need the work. Just then, Aristos enters the restaurant. He eyes Hanish, but has, having presumably caught the tail end of the conflict, he makes a point to charm the restaurant owner. Hello. Hello. Is this the world's famous best restaurant I have heard so much about? Well, uh, yeah, yes, it is, sir. And to whom might we have the pleasure of serving? My name is Aristos. I'm visiting from the nearby Greek military base. Owner takes a moment to look at the several badges of honor on Aristos's uniform. Oh, and I see you must be of a high rank, Mr. Aristos. Half my meal and drink is of the same high quality as your perception. I expect to be back quite often. There's lots of money to that. Then your food and service here is excellent. Well, you heard right. Well, you heard right. Mr. Huh? Well, you heard right, Mr. And while we are about to close for the night, I will make an exception. Mr. Talking over. Sorry, I'm just hearing. I'm just hearing. Yeah, folks. If if once again we're we're doing pretty well here on the read, but if anyone has a um, a phone or if they're moving around, if they can self regulate and self. Uh, okay, sorry about mute. That. If they're not act actively reading right now. 
let's pick it up. Uh, go ahead, Bob. And what you heard right, Mr. Arastas. Well, we were about to close for the night. I'll make an exception for you to prove that praiseworthy. Please take a seat, and I'll be right over to take your order. Will you be expecting company, Mr. Orestes? Perhaps some of your fellow officers from the base will be joining you. Tonight, I would like to request the company of this young lady. Aristos raises a gentle open hand to indicate Hanish, who is by now back to clearing the table. Her? Hanish? Anish, what a lovely name. I assume she must be one of your daughters? Uh, no, 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 of course not. She is but a village rat. A what? A village girl. She works here. Ah, then she is not your daughter then. Uh, of course not. Then you shall have no aversion to me sharing my meal and my money with her tonight. This lovely lady has my company. Uh, I, it's not customary. It's fine. I will eat with the servicemen. Aristos and the owner turn their heads in unison, surprised she has spoken up for herself. Transition to Constantine, now seated by himself at a table in the corner of the restaurant. He sips a glass of red wine. Perhaps it was the power dynamic. Perhaps it was the allure of forbidden fruit. And one thing to note, folks, is that when Constantine speaks, a lot of times he's speaking directly to camera, which uh, Jose is doing a great job at. Uh, interior, ladies' room, night. Hanish looks at herself in the mirror. She takes the scarf off her head, lets her hair drop to their natural position on top of her shoulders. She pulls out her... She pulls out... I'm getting some echo, folks. If you have those earbuds or whatever, that's why it helps. If you have earbuds, it helps. And if you can self-regulate with a mute. Uh, back to the scene. Interior, ladies' room, night. Hanish looks at herself in the mirror. She takes the scarf off her head, lets her hair drop to their natural position on top of her shoulders. She pulls out a stick of lipstick and runs it across her lips. That simply, she is transformed. Hanish smiles at her own reflection. Uh, back to the restaurant. Aristos sits at his table by himself, looking out the window to the streets outside. Constantine, from his table, watches Aristos into the kitchen. Meanwhile, the owner, serving also as Bastis's chef, puts together a meal with a disgruntled facial expression. Several pans boil with flavors. Interior, restaurant, night. Constantine continues to watch Aristos look out the window. Arastos, an accomplished man, from what I understand of him. A good man, from what I've been told. A Greek military ambassador or something of the sort. A high-ranking official. When Ish enters the room, emerging from a set of swinging doors, she is even lovelier now, without the streets of the stress of work on her shoulders. Aristos turns and takes a look at her. A smile comes across his face. Constantine watches him watch her. Who's to say why a man falls in love? She was not even a waitress. She was a dishwasher from a poor home without much connection to her own family or her own people. By the numbers, she did not have much to offer such a man of the world. As Hanish walks timidly into the room, Aristos stands at attention. Hanish comes to Aristos. He salutes her. She smiles, then laughs. She salutes him back. Aristos pulls out a chair for the young lady and pours her a glass of wine. Constantine, still unseen by either, from his table, watches them with intensity. The summer of love wasn't just in San Francisco, you understand. You see somebody, you go for it. It was the nature of the times. Don't ask me how a military man ends up with a dishwasher. People back then didn't ask as many questions before engaging in carnal delights. Owner enters the room and delivers a huge meal to the new couple. Hanisha's eyes glow in delight as the hot dishes that she normally cleans up after are now being served fresh to her. Aristos smiles, back in the company of this beautiful younger woman. Even the owner's countenance seems to soften a little. Owner lights a candle at their table and leaves the two alone. They smile. This is romantic stuff, Jose. They smile. They smile and their eyes flicker in the candlelight. The night fully sets in. 
Back to Constantine, <laughs> alone at his table. He takes another long sip of red wine and narrates as we cut between him and the new couple enjoying each other's company at the table. Although it's disputed that she was only his wife. That she was his uh, only wife. That he, she was his only wife, excuse me. But <laughs> Just throw it over here. Sorry, yeah. Okay. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Although it's disputed that she was his only wife, Arastos, the mysterious Greek military man, married the poor but proud Egyptian dishwasher named Hanish. He took her from poverty and her struggles and put her into his small assigned home on a military base there in Egypt, where only six scandalous months after their marriage ceremony, she gave birth to the one and only child, a son. At the table, both with, wild sm both with wide smiles and drinking, Aristos puts his hand on Hanisha's knee. She looks down to it, sees his well-manicured fingers adored with large rings, and puts her hand on top of his. She lifts his hand off her knee and onto the table. They look romantically into each other's eyes. Back to Constantine. I am that son, the son of Erastos and Hanish. I am Constantine. This is my story. Everybody's got a story, but this one is mine. He takes his final sip, fade into the title card, The First Betrayal. Exterior, military base, morning, text on screen, a year later, Greek military base, Egypt, a series of establishing shots of the military base. The grounds are well kept, but lacking in flavor. The buildings have an industrial, generic, prefabricated feel. There is very little sense of anything cosmetically original or unique in any aspect of this environment. Interior, base home, Aristos' bedroom, morning. Aristos picks a suitcase full of packs a suitcase full of clothes. Hanish sits on the corner of their bed, staring a hole into him. Do you realize you're leaving your newborn son and your wife? Always the hand with the most. Excuse me? What was that? I told you. Two weeks. A baby's cry is heard. We see our full grown Constantine sitting in their bedroom in his suit in a chair fiddling with a, baby, with a baby's rattle in his hand. Constantine looks direct to us. Wah. Wah. Neither <laughs> Hanish... <laughs> so the idea, folks, is that uh, basically Constantine as an adult is appearing in the flashback of his childhood when his parents are fighting. Neither Hanish nor Aristos are aware of the technique of full-grown Constantine in the room. Throughout this exchange, Constantine can be seen in the background as he observes with an occasional cry. Your son misses you already. He is telling you not to go. Constantine is only six months old himself. <laughs> Come on. You'll never know I'm gone. I will know. This is the military life, Hanish. The man travels, the wife stays home. This isn't a home. It's a base. <sighs> you must make this base your home, or any base we might move to in the future. Sure. There are many people here for you to interact with. There's a whole group of Greek and international mothers with young babies and play groups that you can introduce to. Become acclimated. This is your family. I took you out of that village to give you a better life. I just wish you'd take advantage of it. I will always be part of the village. We were washing dishes when I found you. What did you say? Perhaps we just missed time apart. We just had a child. You're leaving me. I am not leaving you. I'm going to see my brother, Nicholas. Nico just had his first son, Aristotle. I'm going to be the godfather, the uncle. I must see my family. You have your own son, Connie. Our full-grown Constantine winces at his mother's utterance of Connie. Mm. Wah. Wah. <laughs> Don't call him that. His name is Constantine. We did not have a girl. Hanish switches gears from angry to whimsical and soft. I've always wanted a girl. A proper mother should have one of each. You stay and give me another child, a girl, 
and we named her Connie. Constantine and Connie, a boy and a girl, a proper family, one of each. When I return, we may be back. She goes to him, touches his chest, pushes him on the bed. No, the offer is for now, only. You stay here and make me my second child. He smiles sweetly, then deadpans. But what if our second child is a boy? Is also a boy. She throws up her arms in a fit. No, one boy is enough. No more boys. You're starting to sound like my mother now, manipulating everything. You fit right in at home in Greece. Then take me there. Take me and your son to meet the, his newborn cousin. Someday I will. Someday they will meet and play and be best friends. I promise you. But not today. I need you to stay here and answer the phone in case anyone looks for me. Who would be looking for you? Management. They don't know about the full length of my trip. Why not? What's the secret? I'm writing it up as a business expense. They think I'm looking at alternative weaponry. You're lying to your bosses? You'll get fired. You'll get kicked out. Everybody does it. I'll get a little work done on the plane and justify it if anybody asks. I just didn't want to waste my own money on such a quick trip. I'm saving our own money for the end of the year. Christmas? Isturina. Greek Christmas. A month-long celebration. Come December, the two boys will be a little older. By then, enough to play with each other, perhaps, perhaps even fight with each other, like little boys often do. They'll still be babies. He pats her stomach. And who knows, by Kisturina, maybe we'll be having a little girl or a second little boy. For us Greeks, family is everything. That is why I must see my brother to welcome my nephew to this world. They now sit on the bed together. Please, don't go. Last night I had a nightmare of you dying, an explosion, a death. I had a dream you left me and our son alone forever. Constantine from the corner lets out a small whimper. <laughs> See, <laughs> he knows, your son knows. He is six months old, too young to know anything. But he will learn. The world will teach him. Say goodbye to your son. I will never have my to They hear the honking horn from a car outside. Aristos takes his bag and exits the room. Hanish hears a door slam from the other room. She begins to cry. Constantine studies his mother from a distance. Then he turns to us. And unfortunately, my mother was right. My father did not return. He prophecy was correct. I was a child and I had to ask many times. And my mother, she had to tell me many times. From his chair in the corner, the adult Constantine questions his mother as he remembers her from back then. Constantine, now as the adult that guides us through this backstory, talks to his memory of his mother in the way that he wanted to talk to her as a boy. Mother, when is father coming home? Do not ask that, Connie. Not again. Do not call me Connie, mother. That is a girl's name. Where is my father? I told you, son. He's eternal. He will never leave you, Connie. He has he left. left. He has not. He is he dead. dead. Exterior, military base, courtyard day. Constantine, now wearing a schoolboy outfit as of a teenager, stands in the middle of the courtyard as schoolmates pass by him in the background, unaware of him. I am very grateful that my father had earned so much respect from the military that the base allowed me and my mother to stay in our humble home. It was not much, but it was ours. They let us eat in the cafeteria for free, but whatever spending money we would have, well should have come from my mother's working, but she did not work. She did not do much. She was just a full-time grieving widow. Bert, a bully, 18 years old and oversized, comes over and knocks 
Constantine's hat off his head. There he is, the bastard, the fatherless boy. Constantine bends over to pick up his hat. At this point, the schoolmates in the background begin to notice the altercation, but keep their distance. Bert kicks Constantine in the butt, knocking him to the ground. The schoolmates ooh and ah in response. Constantine scurries up to his feet, but, Ger but Bert grabs him around the shirt collar. Now then, you wouldn't want to cause trouble. You wouldn't want to cause a fight. Yes, I would. No, you wouldn't. Your mother wouldn't approve. Are her papers in order? Does she have the proper residency? Does anyone know she's even here? Constantine is humbled, humiliated. I thought not. You just be good, quiet boy. Connie, the boy with a girl's name. The schoolmates laugh mockingly. Bert walks off. Nice, Bert. Constantine. Bert. Bert the bully. And this is... And this is a painful part. I'd like to kill him to this day. Not just then, but still to this day. Hanisha's voice is heard, yelling at her son to come home. Connie! Connie! The schoolmates laugh. Don't call me! Hanisha enters the courtyard, wearing a bathrobe, waving at Constantine, getting the attention of the schoolmates. Connie, come home! Connie! Connie! Constantine snaps at the figures in his memory. Don't you call me that name, goddammit! I'll kill every one of you little pricks! The courtyard empties upon his roar. Everyone, schoolmates and Hanish, are gone. Only Constantine remains. I'm sorry, that, that was not me. Uh, not who I am, not really. You see, I, I used to watch these television shows. Interior, Constantine's bedroom night. Constantine is now in his childhood bedroom. It's sparsely decorated with just a few hints of the early 1970s aesthetics. Ah, Constantine yes. sits on the floor, his hands wrapped around his knees, eyes glued to a small black and white TV set, as if he was a child. Ah, yes. My setup. My room. My small room. For many years, this was my life. On the TV set appears the black and white 1938 prohibition film, What? No Beer, starring Buster Keaton and Jimmy Durante. Ah, yes. Jimmy Durante, my favorite. Good night, Mrs. Calabash. Wherever you are, be nice to people on your way up because you meet them on your way down. ha cha -ra cha And this is where I find myself. In these movies, these old black and white movies of those crazy Americans. So brutal, so bold. I loved it. And then... Exterior, town square, night. Our adult Constantine, dressed in his best schoolboy clothes, strolls towards the town's best movie theater. Guess what? A movie came to town. The first movie I ever really wanted to go see. Not in the military base little theater with their second-run screenings and their stiff wooden chairs. The white, boring popcorn with no butter syrup. I wanted to see this movie in the real theater, here in the town square of Marina, a 20-minute walk from home, on my own. And guess what I saw? I'll give you a hint, a sequel. A sequel to an Oscar-winning film, a movie about an, about an underdog, an Italian-American underdog who overcomes the big challenge to do himself, his family, and his people proud. That's right. You got it. Constantine approaches the theater. The marquee, the marquee reads, now playing, first time in Egypt, The Godfather Part Two. Constantine smiles. The Godfather. Constantine raises his fingers in the universal peace sign of two raised fingers. Two. Interior, movie theater night. Constantine sits with a bucket of popcorn and a soda, watching The Godfather Part Two. Constantine has a huge smile. He turns to us. The Godfather, the American dream, the immigrant, the family, the heritage, all of this, I understand it. Or I, I wanted to understand it. For me, family was always a pain in the ass. 
my mother the biggest pain. Just then, Hanish comes barging into the theater. Connie, Connie. Oh, my. Connie, Constantine, are you in here? Shh. Hey, lady, be quiet. Bert is in the audience with some friends from school. Hey, what is this? Hanish passes by Constantine in the aisle, and he tugs her by her arm and pulls her into a seat next to him. Mother, sit down. Here. What are you doing here, Constantine? He raises his hands in an exasperated expression to indicate the screen and the theater they are currently in. I'm watching a movie, Mother. Quiet down! We're trying to watch the film. Connie, that worm from school. A theater attendant rushes into the scenario. Constantine melts in his chair from embarrassment. Um, excuse me, I'm going to have to ask you to take your conversation out to the lobby. My son, Constantine, has no use for these trashy American movies. Hanish grabs Constantine by the ear and pulls him out of his chair. Mother, mother! Attendant leads Hanish and Constantine out of the auditorium as the theater audience heckles. <sighs> Mama's boy, gotta go home. What a radical departure. From his seat, Bert basks in the moment to his sidekicks. Scolded by his mother for going to the movies. I can't wait to tell everybody at the base. Interior, movie theater, lobby, night. Their situation continues. Mother, I can't believe you. How did you know where I was? And mother knows. Let's go back in and watch the movie. Have you done your studies? Done my studies, mother? As Hanish speaks here, Constantine uses his hand to imitate flapping lips as she speaks. Don't, don't mock me, Constantine. I do not speak the studied English like you do. I did not get the learning like you did. She finally notices his mocking hand. Don't you mock me. She slaps him across the face. Don't you mock me, mother. Constantine touches his own cheek, then looks to his own hand. His voice turns dark, cryptic. Yes, mother. And that is the last time I will ever mock you. And that is the last time you will ever give me a slap. Do you understand me? What has happened? What is happening to my son? What is this monster that came from me? She recoils in fear and exits the movie lobby into the street in tears. I decided by watching these movies that the American dream could also be mine. Mine, if I worked hard enough and just got a break. Met the right people, come on. Let's get back to the movie. Constantine heads back to, into the theater. Interior, movie theater, day. Constantine walks back into the theater, but now The Godfather 2 is no longer on the screen. The theater is empty, and all the house lights are on. For the first time, Constantine sees that there is also a performance stage underneath the movie screen. Constantine tentatively walks down the theater aisle and onto the stage. He gets up there, and after a moment, starts doing a series of quick impersonations. Durante, Brando, Pacino, De Niro. Emilda, an attractive and overtly animated high school girl, enters the theater from the back. Constantine follows her with his with follows her with her eyes. I should read Constantine follows her with his eyes as she sashays down the aisle towards him. Hello. Constantine just looks at her in awe of her looks and over the top personality. Hello. Do you speak? Um, are you talking to me? <laughs> Is that a Robert De Niro impersonation from Taxi Driver? I don't see anybody else here. She hops up on stage next to him, getting right in his face. Why? Why would you say that? Why would you uh, do that? Uh, well... Um, Are you talented? Ta talent? Do you have talent? I've got some bad ideas in my head. 
you're here for the club, right? Club? The Moth Club? <laughs> Our theater club. Club. Theater club. Well, I just started it. My family lives on the nearby military base and dad pulled some favors with the owner of this theater to get me the space anytime I want it. You must be my first student. I'm your student now? <laughs> yes, in acting, movies, Broadway. Don't you just love it? Uh, I could give it a shot. I, I could. I could have been a contender. I could be a contender. Impersonations aren't acting, but it's a good start. You've got to find your own words, your voice, your own character. My own voice? Where would that come from? A playwright, I suppose. But you take those words and you make them your own. The character to the words on the page conceives the character you are portraying. Give birth to yourself. That sounds very self-involved. Well, it's self-focused, self-disciplined but there's nothing self-involved about acting or actors. We're all very generous we're with our spirits, with our souls. With your bodies? <laughs> if you're serious, I would teach you. I would train you. You would do that for me? To be my partner, my scene partner, for when I need somebody to play off of for an audition or to run lines. I see. So, I to serve you. But I would be helping you too. I know raw talent when I see it. And besides, it's good karma. For the craft, for my career, for my passion. And just like that, I had a girlfriend. At least I, I thought I did for a little while. Back to Constantine and Amilda in another session of their acting classes. Okay, passion princess. <laughs> Let me try some more of my raw, untrained acting for you. There is no try. There is only to do. Either you do it or you don't. My father made him an offer he can't refuse. He couldn't refuse. <laughs> the godfather? Well, actually, it's, that's Michael, the godfather. The original Godfather, you know? Rando as Don Vito. I'm not quite there yet. I do their voices in, in my head, in the bathroom. You know, when, I, uh, when mm -hmm. I'm going. Your Pacino is fine, but you're gagging on impersonations, Constantine. You need a monologue. What's that? When you get to speak and nobody gets to talk back. They just have to listen to whatever you have to say. I see. <laughs> I think my mother was very good at monologues. Meanwhile, unbeknownst to Constantine and Amilda, Bert the bully slips into the back of the auditorium. He watches them throughout the rest of this sequence, but they never notice his spine. I'm going to make a quick change. Let me, um, thanks, uh, that's good, um, Anastasia. But let me have Jordan do the rest of the scene with uh, Amilda. Thanks. Sure. Constantine turns to us. <sighs> Young love. It's an amazing thing. It's amazing also how people discount it. As if these older people don't want the younger people to fall in love. Do not want them to be happy. I have found that love is hard to find. It's like a dangerous game to search for love. You find love yourself hurt. You find yourself hurt to get that love. You feel the joy, but then only the pain of losing it. Imelda's eyes tear up as if she had been hearing his direct to a camera aside. Oh my God. That monologue was awesome. You're totally ready. Constantine closes his eyes as if expecting a kiss. Ready? She smashes a script into his chest. To do a scene with me, 
a dialogue, a scene between a wealthy baron and his young, impressionable mistress. You're the baron, and you've got to convince me to stop philandering around and stay at home. Very interesting. Yes, it's very intense. I wrote it myself. Now let's get started. What do I do? Just read for the Baron. I'll even let you be on book the first time. On book? You can look at your script, but try and lock and load. Lock down to the page to get the words, then look up at me when you say them. This is all very overwhelming to him, but he desperately wants to impress her. I'll try. There's no try. Just do it. He clears his throat and finally begins in a quick and nervous staccato. He reads his own character name of the Baron by mistake. The Baron. Sweetheart, where are you going? I'm going to the art house to see my friends. And pose for them. Don't do that. No, read the script. The script. She grabs his script and taps on his words with her finger to illustrate the point. Oh, uh, but okay. I just want to jump in. Uh, Amilda, I, I really need like a, 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 try to do like a, have fun with this, like a really big over the top, like theatrical high school acting student. That's what Amilda is. Like she's okay. really over the top. That's what okay. I'm trying to get to. Okay. Uh, she grabs his script and taps on his words with her finger to illustrate her point. Oh, right. The Baron. Please, dear. No, no, no. Don't read the words, the Baron. You are the Baron. You um, are the Baron. Like, she's, she, she thinks of herself as, like, the acting coach. So she's always kind of, like, over the top and correcting him. You know what I mean? Okay. All right. She grabs his script and taps on his words with her finger to illustrate her point. Oh, right. Uh, the Baron. Please, dear. No, no, no. Don't read the words, the Baron. You are the Baron. Oh, I am the Baron. Yes, you have great strength and power. You don't need to tell us that you are the Baron. Just be the Baron. In fact, don't even be the Baron. The Baron is. He is. Constantine lets this lesson sink in. He clears his throat, takes a deep breath, and st starts again. <clears throat> Please, dear, do not leave me again tonight. I must have you stay at home and be with me. Stop hanging around the villagers with those artist boys. You must not allow them to paint you anymore. I must not be seeing images of my lovely lover around the village without the clothing like some moose. Muse, muse. M muse, stay home tonight and I will have the servants fix your favorite meal and then I will make love to you under the moonlight on our veranda. Baron, please, you must do this with me what you will. Punish me, treat me poorly, discipline me, ravish me. Constantine looks at his scripts in confusion. It says I take you and kiss you. Yes, then do it. He does. No, stronger. Constantine increases his hold on her to her delight. She swoons. That was amazing. I really felt it. Constantine looks down to his crotch, embarrassed. Oh, felt, felt what? Your passion. Was that your first time? Uh, kissing? Acting. I, uh, yes, of course, of course. Uh, in a scene like that, I mean, uh, I've been doing my Godfather movies, voices for years, but, uh, but this... This was the first time I've ever acted with somebody. You were, you were my first. And what yes. did you think of it? Acting? He looks at her deep into her eyes. I loved it. I love acting. And acting loves you. A rare smile crosses Constantine's face. Exterior, military base, courtyard day. Constantine walks back home, a swing in his step. Yes, young love, adoration, lost, all the future in the world, all the choices. The world is that oyster we all hope for, we all dig for. Not many can catch that precious oyster of the world. My mother didn't. She got nothing but rocks 
Constantine approaches the front door to their modest home. Interior, base home, living room, day. Constantine enters. Hanish is sitting in the living room with a worn out on a worn out couch, nervously smoking a cigarette. Connie, you're home? Yes, mother. You're smoking? Just a few. My nerves. I was thinking about your father. It stinks up the whole home, mother. Hanish pats the couch. Come, sit next, next, sit next to your mother. Put that thing out and I'll consider it. She puts it out. Constantine sits on the couch besides her. How was math club? A funny thing happened on the way to math club. Somehow I ended up in another club. And you went to the I was going to, yes, but uh, you, did. you went to the math club, yes? Yes, mother. And you did well? Of course I did. That's my boy, my Connie. This weekend, I get you a special tutor to help you with your math. I'm getting straight A's, mother. But the math is very hard, and this tutor is very good. What's the tutor's name, mother? Edmund. Edmund the Englishman. You're dating him. I'm a widow, Connie. Widows don't date. We mourn forever. It's fine, mother. Date him. He stands and impersonates her in an over-the-top fashion. Edmund the Englishman. She laughs. <laughs> My Connie. But I don't need the tutelage. I'm doing fine in math in all of my subjects, I am. But MIT in America has the toughest program to get into for math. What is this? Hanish goes to a desk and pulls out a stack of papers she's been apparently working on. She pushes the papers into her son's hands. And we must fill out the application. I spoke to your aunt, and your younger cousin loves MIT and has already been grooming for an early acceptance. You're falling behind him, Connie. Constantine looks over the MIT application papers in shock. Enough of the Connie for one day, mother. Constantine! I thought if you worked with Edmund, he could help you... Help me? With your application, Connie. He has friends in America, in Boston, and they could help you, perhaps. He could write you a letter. A letter? To who? To the consular of MIT and help you get accepted. <sighs> what would this letter say? How much you desire to study mathematics. It's been a dream of yours since you were a child and that you work so hard but have so little money since your father died honorably in the Greek military. I have, I have no desire for mathematics, mother. mother. It means it's nothing to me. <sighs> it's a living, a good, solid foundation. You work hard for 30 or 40 years and then you can do whatever you want. And this is what you want for me? For you, yes. And for me. And for your father. My father is dead. I know. But he would have had one You to be with my tutor. She goes to slap him, but he catches her by the wrist. I'll go to America, mother. I'll go. But on my terms. And I'll do it my way. And what is your way, Constantine? I'll be like Al Pacino. Is he on the base? He is a famous man, a powerful man, an actor in Hollywood. Hollywood is excess in drug um is excess in drugs. Movies are nonsense. You'll go to Boston and study at MIT in math and serious matters. No, that is not my plan. That is my dream. Your father, now you. You're leaving me. I can't leave you, mother. I have and never been with you. Exterior, town square day. Constantine walks on his own, looking over the local sites with a certain disdain. Film. Cinema. I thought it would be my life, my calling. To lose myself in the minds of the writers. To lose myself in the minds of the audience. I enjoyed it. I cherished it. 
I went to see Emilda and tell her what I wanted to be an actor professionally. And I wanted her to come with me for the ride to be my leading lady. Exterior, movie theater day. Constantine approaches the theater. He looks up to the marquee. It reads, special encore screening by popular demand, love story. Interior, movie theater day. Emilda stands on stage by herself. She looks at her watch. Not like him to be late. Well, I'll just warm up on my own. Fa la 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 la. Rubber baby buggy bumpers. Rubber baby bumper bubby buggy bumpers. She closes her eyes. She begins to hum dramatically to warm up her throat. Mm. Bert enters from the shadows. Bert calls out in a 1940s film gangster voice in the same ballpark of Constantine's Pacino and De Niro impersonations. Hey, good looking. What you got cooking? Oh my, who comes to see me? It's me, sweetheart. Here to collect my debt. Now keep your eyes closed and open your mouth. Oh, my. Thinking uh, this scene, Emilda thinks it's Bert, thinks it's Constantine when it's actually Bert. Bert oh. snickers to himself, then hops up on stage. Well, what are you waiting for? Constantine? Bert registers disgust at hearing Constantine's name. Then he swoops in and puts a hard kiss on Emilda's mouth. Just as the kiss begins, Constantine enters the auditorium. He stays in the back, just observing the kiss. An expressionist pale comes over his face, a countenance he'll never quite lose. Constantine turns and exits the auditorium without ever being seen by Emilda. But Bert catches a glimpse of Constantine exiting in the back. A cruel smile crosses Bert's face. He increases his forcefulness and use of tongue in his kiss. Emilda taps on Bert's back with a balled up hand, trying to signal a kisser, who she still thinks is Constantine, to ease up. Emilda finally opens her eyes to see that it's Bert, not Constantine, kissing her so roughly. What? What are you doing? Who are you? This is where I get my acting lessons, right? I heard you've been doing some one-on-one -on -one classes. She steps back from him, stunned and in shock. You don't do that. You don't just kiss somebody. Hey, hey, all right. I bet no theater fag ever kissed you like that before. Go. Get out. Bert hops off the stage and exits through a side door. If you get bored, I'll be here. You're lucky you even got kissed. Emilda crumbles into herself and sits on the edge of the stage, trying to make sense of what just happened. After a moment, Constantine come, enters again through the entrance in the back. He slowly walks towards her, judging her all, all the way, but not allowing himself to show emotion. She remains seated on the, on the edge of the stage, a few feet raised off the ground level, and he stands about four feet away from her throughout this exchange. Everything all right? She puts on a facade. Yes, yes, Constantine. Everything's fine. You're crying. I was just acting out a scene, and it was emotional. You're passionate. Always. An actress must have her passion on her fingertips. Yes. Anything you want to tell me? About what? He stands there for a moment, waiting for her explanation, but she, not realizing what he witnessed, and still trying to make sense of Bert's attack herself, can't bring herself to speak of it. So instead, she sits and he stands in terse silence. Oh. I don't feel much for acting today. Oh. Would you like to... Is there's nothing I'll be going. Going where? Constantine turns his back on her and walks up the aisle, away from her, forever. She calls out to him in a guttural cry. Constantine! 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 He does not turn back. He exits the auditorium into the lobby. Movie theater lobby day, continuous. Constantine passes through the theater lobby without a word, passing by the popcorn machine and the movie posters without a second glance. Constantine exits into the streets. The lobby remains open, but empty. Movie theater day, exterior, continuous. Constantine exits the theater lobby into the street, his eyes focused ahead, allowing no emotion to control him. But it was not to be. Interior, airplane day. Constantine, in flight, looks out the airplane window. He sits in the first class 
section of the from the plane in a row all to himself. He wears his father's suit. I'd have my first taste of love, or something like it, on my flight to America from Egypt. My flight to MIT in Boston, as was decided. I suppose I looked a little impressive that day, and my confidence was unusually high. Tina, 25, an attractive, flirty international stewardess, comes over to Constantine. Would you like a drink, sir? What kind of drink are you offering? <laughs> we have many kinds. Do you have an ID? I'm a bit uh, young. I can see. Young and full of <laughs> soda pop. Soda pop? How about a milk? How about a shot? A shot. How about I give you the best shot I've got? Interior, airplane bathroom day. Constantine and Tina have sex in the airplane bathroom. Interior, airplane day. Back in his first seat chair, first class chair, Constantine sits and looks up to Tina, who is back in front of the plane composing herself. He smiles at her. She smiles back. He toasts to her. He is now drinking scotch. Constantine smiles and turns to us. During Constantine's monologue, we see a montage of stock footage of mid-1980s USA pop culture. Ronald Reagan, the 1984 Summer Olympics, McDonald's dad, Rocky IV, Rambo, E.T., Raiders of the Lost Ark, and Ghostbusters film clips, uh, clips from USA for Africa, We Are the World, Music video, TV shows like The Cosby Show and The Facts of Life, Bruce Springsteen, The East Beat Band and Concert, etc. So, off to America, the land of opportunity, entrepreneurship, adventure, but first, the university, MIT, serious business, math, serious stuff. I was good at it. I didn't have a passion for it, but I was good at it. And I figured passion is overrated. Passion gets you hurt. Passion gets you killed, emotionally involved. And so I put the brakes on, the blinders on. I concentrated on my studies and the college scholarship applications and whatever it took to get out of Egypt, the military base, and away from my mother. My mother? Well, to her credit, she worked hard. To, she put her mind together with her aunts and did all the paperwork. They got me some type of scholarship for fatherless military kids, and to MIT I went. I don't know how they did it, but they did. Those hens with their feathers all aligned in proper place. Constantine eyes over Tina again. She eyes him back, licking her lips at him. He smiles. There will be plenty of time for women like this. First, I must make my fortune. So, if math was going to be it, math it was going to be it. My meal ticket off the base in Egypt and to Boston in America. Once I got over there, I figured, eh, I'll do whatever the hell I want. I might even be a gangster. Montage of Boston Mass Exteriors circa 1986. Exterior, MIT Day. Establishing shot of MIT College Campus entrance. Several establishing shots of MIT's prestigious campus. Constantine Walk College Courtyard Day. Constantine walks along the campus, surveying the beautiful grounds and noticing a group of three attractive Caucasian female students dressed in their best 1980s fashions. So, here I am, a college freshman. He looks again to the girls. Enjoying the sights. I came to MIT a week early to get acclimated. My mother wanted me to look up my aunts and uncles from my father's side of the family, so I could, I guess, make up for lost time somehow. I didn't bother. I had had enough of family for one lifetime. 
my free week was my first week ever away from my mother and I, I wanted to belong to just myself. So I made my way around the campus and did what I could do to explore the surrounding city. But besides this campus, Boston was mostly a dump. People with funny voices. So here I am on the campus. First official day of classes, hoping to make some friends. He approaches the girls. Hello there. Tennis, anyone? You play? I, I never had, but uh, you teach me, yes? You got a racket? No, we play with our hands. We got a uh, Caucasian girl, number three. Jordan, you want to take that real quick? Oh, my God. He's, like, from Mexico or something? Gross. Mexico? No jugar. We have a test to study for. It's the first day of classes. Vamos, a key. The three girls laugh to each other, then exit. Constantine sees a building labeled Student Union. He walks towards it. Interior, student union, student union building. Constantine walks through the student union building where he sees various first day of school type activities. He does his next direct to camera as he observes these activities. Students congregate, catch up with friends they haven't seen since the year before. Some students wait in line to see a counselor. Some confused freshmen ask for help from various school staff. What is the use of having such a wonderful campus if no one puts out any good use to it? Constantine walks down a hallway and pokes his head into the student union arcade room. Insert shot. An arcade room full of pool tables and popular video games of that era. Dig Dug, Centipede, Pac-Man, Asteroids, Defender, Dragon's Lair, etc. There are no students actually using any of the games, however. Constantine shakes his head in disgust. We were young, hungry, attractive, all in the prime of our lives. But these kids, these MIT kids, all they wanted to do was study. Nobody wanted to fuck. Constantine hears an outburst of laughs from several feet behind him. Constantine turns to see who the laughter came from. It's a pack of three boys and three girls in their late teens and early 20s, a much more multicultural group, not just Caucasian. The group has commandeered a, lar a lounge room with cushy couches, chairs, and a lot of open spaces to themselves. He sees that in their group, the women are, are all fairly attractive. Constantine makes a move to the direction of the group, but its path is cut off by Professor Cho, 50. Professor Cho wears a button-down light blue shirt and a tan sports coat. Constantine tries to pass Cho, but they engage in an awkward you-go-first routine. Uh, excuse me. Cho just smiles but avoids eye contact. They do another round of the You Go First dance until finally Cho freezes in his tracks and stretches out his arm in a presentational manner to allow Constantine to pass. Thanks. Constantine walks several feet, shaking his head in confusion at the dance with Cho. While walking forward, Constantine twists his neck back to glance at Cho, but now the man is gone. The laughter of the pack of college kid continues all the while. Intrigued, Constantine walks towards them and enters the space, keeping to the sides, but looking for an opening to introduce himself, or better yet, looking for them to introduce themselves to him. One of the guys, Aristotle, is the best looking and best dressed, and clearly the alpha male of the group. He is holding court, telling a long-winded story, while almost everyone placates to him. I and Aristotle in awe are Kimmy and Jan, both about 19, fawn over Aristotle, like he's a rock star. A third girl, Stacy, 20, sits in a cushy seat, reading a book with an occasional glimpse to the action. Jaffo, a huge guy at over six foot four and 300 pounds, 22 years old, and Javier, a younger, jumpier guy at 18, stand by like bodyguards. Jaffo could actually work in security, but Javier, not so much. So, what happened next? Aristotle tells a story with a natural performer's exuberance. Well, then I told that professor, my family's donating $25,000 to the alumni fund at this university on a quarterly basis. And with that type of loyalty, I'd like to think any accusation of me cheating on a final exam can be written off as a false bias. 
Oh, my God. What did he say back? 25,000. That certainly is generous. What type of business is your family in? I said, teach, keep your pencil pushed in my direction and you'll never have to find out. The other five, with the exception of Stacy, who just rolls her eyes, erupts in laughter. <laughs> Constantine notices a head pop into the room for just a moment to, to survey the scene. It's the same Professor Cho from the hallway. Professor Cho looks around the area full of laughing college kids, seemingly taking a special interest in Stacy. Constantine catches Professor Cho's glance, and the two make a terse moment of eye contact before Cho shrugs and exits without saying a word, having not been spotted by anyone but Constantine. When the chuckles from the kids die down, Constantine makes his opportunity to introduce himself. What's the false bias? Excuse me? The false bias. The false bias you claimed was behind the accusation of you cheating. The group oozes a bit at Constantine taking the newcomer, uh, the, of, at Constantine the newcomer taking their issue to task. You, you're lucky that teacher was a stooge and easily impressed. Someone with a set of balls would have challenged you a bit. The group oozes again. Javier hops in. Hey, buddy, who asked you? It's just a story. A story or a truth? A story needs truth, but the truth doesn't need a story. Stacy chimes in from her chair. Wow, Moses got off the hill at MIT. I believe it was Jesus who spoke on the hill. Moses parted the sea. If you believe in the truth in that story. The joyful mood of the group has been killed and they start to disperse. Aristotle tries to keep, uh, tries to reclaim the good times. Hey, it's all right, everybody. A new friend is just a little awkward. Constantine shoots Aristotle a hard look, who was oblivious to this. Aristotle wraps his, around, his arm around Constantine's back as if to buddy up to him. What's your name, friend? But Constantine knocks off Aristotle's arm aggressively and raises his fist as if to challenge him. Big man Jaffo springs into action with raised fists of his own, squaring off with Constantine. Javier hops around the background like a hyena. The girls all step back to watch. Three on one, huh? Hmm? That's all you got? Just give me the word, Ace. I'll take him out on my own. Size over speed any day. But Constantine beats Jeffo to the punch as he runs up to the big man and wallops him with a jab in the belly, more to make a point than to actually hurt him. Constantine and Jaffo make eye contact. Constantine gives Jaffo a hard look, but Jaffo returns the look with an awkward look of shock. Jaffo steps back, grabs his belly in an exaggerated way as if about to get sick, rubs it, then releases a room-clearing belch. The moment makes everybody laugh. Everybody but Constantine. He still stands, straight-faced, ready to fight with cocked fists while everyone else goes back to their drinks and snacks. Aristotle, who has been eyeing Constantine with a deep curiosity for minutes, pulls out a manila envelope from his backpack and shows its contents to Stacy. The contents appears to be photographs and a letter. Finally, Constantine has no choice but to realize he is standing there awkwardly, ready to fight with no opponent. So, uh, did I win the fight, or did I lose? You haven't lost yet, but it's only the first day of school. Put down your weapons. You're acting like some kind of rogue from the south side. We're at MIT. Behave yourself, cousin. I am not your cousin. Actually, you are. Aristotle snaps his fingers at Stacy. She just tilts her head at him with a don't-you-even-dare expression. Aristotle goes to her and takes one of the photographs from the envelope. He shows it to Constantine. This is, is me, my high school photo from Marina. How did you get it? Your mother sent it to my mother. My mother gave it to me to look for you and, and to look out for you. I... Don't need anybody to do that. You were supposed to get in touch with me once you got to Boston and before classes started, but I never heard a thing. You're my cousin Constantine that I've never seen before. My mysterious, slightly older cousin born six months before me, stowed away on that military base his whole life. And now you're here to make up for lost time and the first thing you do is you 
Try to embarrass me in front of my men and my ladies? Jaffo comes over. Who is this guy, Ace? Aristotle snaps again. Everyone reconvenes in a semicircle around him, even Stacy this time. Aristotle makes a point to introduce everyone by name. Jaffo, Javier, Kimmy, Jan, and my precious Stacy. This is Constantine, my cousin. He's been living under a rock his whole life, but now he's decided to join our pack here at MIT. And my cousin, I am Aristotle. Some call me Ace. Our fathers were brothers, and we, we are blood. The group is intrigued by this announcement. This all hits Constantine very hard. He looks around to the six young faces looking back at him. He can't choose whether to fight or flight, so he freezes. Welcome, my cousin. Javier and Jaffo put Pat Constantine on the back and offer him handshakes while the girls give him welcoming hugs. This welcome group, this welcome of group warmth freezes Constantine. I, I did not know it was you. Oh, it's me and it's you and you've been missing and, and you've been missing out. On what? Oikogenia. I don't know if I'm saying that right. Oh, that's pretty close. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Oikogen yeah. Go ahead. Genia. Say it again, Arthur. Tell him, Anastasia, how to say it right. Ikoyanya. Ikoyanya. Family. Y. Yeah. Ikoyanya. Okay. Good. Let's for the rest of the read. I'm going to give Jose a little direction. Let's um. Let's just do the regular Jose voiced. And not the uh, the Constantine voice, okay? Got it. I want to get the uh, vibe the other way. All right, good. Uh, exterior, Boston Peabody, night. A montage of establishing shots from the 1980s of the city of Boston followed and contrasted by establishing shots of nearby suburb of Peabody. Stock footage can be used. Exterior, Peabody, suburbs, dusk. Constantine exits an old-fashioned yellow cab's back seat and comes out onto the sidewalk. He walks to the suburban home as he talks to us. Ikuyenya. It means not just the house, but the household. The ins and outs. The daily routine. The structure. The family. Family. A concept a bit unusual for me. Just brought up by my lonely mother on that base for so long. So, on this night, with my newfound cousin's insistence, this is my first my first family dinner. Constantine looks to the watch on his wrist. And I was running late. He approaches the front door. He knocks a few times, but nobody answers it. Eventually, he just goes for the handle to let himself in. Interior, foyer, night. Nico enters the foyer and can hear a table full of festive people. I'm sorry, it's Constantine enters the foyer and can hear a table full of festive people already eating. He sees stacks of fall jackets and hats already piled up on the available hooks, so he keeps his own jacket jacket on. Interior, Nico's dining room, night. Constantine enters to see a table full of people stuffing their faces with traditional Greek food, such as pistachios, kalamata olives, fresh virgin oil on breads, tomato and onion salad, goat milk, feta cheese. Uncle Nico, Constantine's father's brother, full name Nicholas, about 55, still at the table with a plate full of food in front of him, twists his head to Constantine. Are you the police? Constantine feels like he's walking on broken glass. He tries to speak, but he's too in awe to get his words out quick, even before he's cut off. Uh, um, 30 minutes ago, you would have been my nephew. Now, you're late. Aunt Sophia, about 50, enters with a beautifully garnished baked lamb as the main course. Any other table would ooh and ah on the presentation of the dish, but for this family, this is just par for the course. Nobody but Constantine even looks up from the stuffing their faces to acknowledge the lamb. Is that for an army? Uncle Nico stands. His wooden chair screeches against the ground in the process. Uncle Nico has a larger-than-life presence. Is this boy slow? This is no army. This is family. Ico yenya. Sophia, busy arranging the table to accommodate the platter of lamb, scolds her husband with a whack of a rolled-up thick cloth newspaper. A family like this ought to be an army. 
And no talk of work at the table. That's the first rule of family dinner. The entire family, except Constantine himself, chimes in to mock Uncle Nico as he repeats his often heard mantra. We don't talk, we don't business, talk business at, at the, the table. table. And that's the first rule that always gets bust. And you're the first one to bust it. I do no such thing. Aunt Thespina, Nico's kid's sister, now in her mid-forties, gorgeous and fun, but somehow still single, comes into the room from the kitchen with two glasses of wine. She keeps one for herself and practically forces a second glass into Constantine's hand. Oh, don't listen to him. Your Uncle Nico does what he wants. You hungry kid will <clears throat> Constantine just sits there saying nothing. Everybody looks around to each other, thinking there's something wrong with their new relative. Another uncle, Nico and Thespina's middle brother, Uncle Dimitri, late 40s, fashionable and flamboyant, speaks up. Well, maybe we should. You look like a full-grown boy. But maybe we should. You look like a full-grown boy. We could cook you up in a stew and eat you for a week. Aunt, Ro <laughs> Aunt Rosemary, Dimitri and Thespina's older sister, but at 52, a few years younger than Nico, chimes in. Oh, Dimitri, eat your dinner and leave the room. Oh, Dimitri, eat your dinner and leave room for fruitcake. Don't scare the boy. He just got off base with his mother. The mother we never see for 30 years? 20 years, Nico. Just 20. Don't exaggerate. You'll make it worse. Constantine swivels his neck in time with all the attention and fast-moving speech. The action freezes for a moment and constantly directly addresses us. So, this is it. The proper family dinner. My mother and I were not like this back on base. Sandwich for her, sandwich for me, the frozen dinner for my mother, frozen dinner for me. Silence. Maybe then television. But here? With a family? Discussions? Arguing? Love? Everything? As my Mexican friends might call it, mi familia. For us Greeks, iku yenya. Constantine goes back to live time with the family. Immediately, Sophia launches into a room, silencing tirade. Enough, enough. That's all in the past. Constantine's mother did what she could, when she could. And now she sent her, sent her boy to be with us, to trust us. We ain't letting her down. She points her fingers dramatically to punctuate these lines. For her. She points to Constantine as if he's not a person. For the boy. She points to the heavens. And for the boy's father. May he rest, God rest his soul. Sophia performs a histrionic sign of the cross, and everyone except Constantine follows suit with various prayers, God rest his souls, etc. Constantine still stands there, overwhelmed by the emotions and passions shown by all. So what? Are you going to do just stand there? Constantine just stands there. So, he's slow. My brother's only son, and he's slow. Such is the world. Kaku, Caracas, Kakunu. Everybody stops what they're doing, looks over at Uncle Nico respectfully, and then again observes Constantine with judgmental eyes. Cousin Louis, 32, sloppy, comes over to Constantine and touches his body, poking him like a bear in the zoo. I don't know. He might be. Maybe. Maybe not. Louis pokes Constantine in the stomach, then pinches his side. Louis asks the room the following question, but his words are directed right into Constantine's face. Is he mentally challenged? Aunt Rosemary physically pulls Louis off of Constantine and into a chair, scolding him along the way. Louis, sit down. That's your cousin Louis. He might be mentally challenged. We, we had him tested once, but it was inconclusive. Co finally, Constantine breaks. I ain't mentally challenged. I go to MIT. Everybody breaks into a sigh of relief. They hear the front door open and two sets of footsteps coming forward. Aristotle break, bursts into the dining room with one step of his girlfriends, with one of his girlfriends, Stacy, the academic one, a step behind him. All right, cousin. So you met the family. Yeah, I sure did. And he ain't mentally challenged, and neither am I. Hey, you trading me for a dollar? Uh, yeah, I'm 1950 Superman, super old. 
The story's gone way past that now. And you gave me a whole dollar for it. That's right. And if you got any more of those, I'll give you another dollar for each one. Oh, you don't have to. They're so old. They don't even make them anymore. I'll take 50 cents an issue. You got it. And everybody's getting along with our new cousin? We got a Dimitri. Well, he's a bit of a stoic, but he's sure good looking and handsomely dressed. He takes after his father. God, God rest his soul. soul. Everyone breaks into more prayers and signs of the cross. God rest his soul. Kaku Karakis Kakunun. Translation, text on screen. From a bad crow, a bad egg. Everyone in the room understands Uncle Nico's warning, except Constantine. From a bad crow. Hush, Louis. Uncle Louis, Uncle Nico takes a moment, then steps, then lets out a deep breath. Yes, Uncle? I need Uncle Nico. Uncle Nico takes a moment, then lets out a deep breath. Constantine, come sit, have dinner. I want to tell you about your father, my brother. Yes, Uncle. Everyone sits. Uncle Nico commands respect. So, Arasto's son, finally, at my table. When your father and I were boys, he was my best friend. He was like a brother to me. He was your brother. That's right, but I choose him. I choose him to be my best friend. He was so classy. So dignified. Even from a young age, everything in its place. Everything in order. One time, we went to church when we were boys, not more than 12. My brother, your father, he cleaned up the church. He cleaned up the church itself. Everything just so. I just watched. He didn't let me touch a thing. The father came back. He said, what? Who does such a thing? What kind of boy cleans up a church without asking? My brother, your father, he just said, cleanliness is next to godliness. We may not be God, but we may be clean. The father was so shocked, so proud, he gave my brother, your father, five whole coins. Sophia interjects. That was a lot of money at the time. He saved those five coins. He saved every coin he ever made. And he made quite a bit. Hush, on that. And what happened to my father, uncle? Was it really what they say? And what do they say? Constantine says nothing. Another time we speak business. At another time. Aristotle, show your cousin to your room. Show him your things. Aristotle gets up and gives his mother a kiss on the cheek. Yes, mom. And thanks for dinner. It was amazing. Stacy, come on. Stacy, such a nice name. And you go to the school yourself, Stacy? I'm studying fashion merchandising. The whole table moans with curious interest that borders on a disapproving groan. Ah, uh, I see. And what good will that do when you go for your MRS? A round of muffled snickers and laughs from the table. What? Dad. Come on. Wow, I was just asking. Nico, that's enough. Many young women are doing quite fine on their own these days without marriage. Look at me. I'm almost 40. Espina's older sister, Aunt Rosemary, and her sister-in-law, Sophia, roll their eyes at each other, hearing Thespina lie about her age. Thespina catches their interaction. And I have yet to marry. Maybe someday, when I find a guy who can... Keep up with me. Uh, I, I'm, I'm okay. I should get back to campus and get some studying done. Stacy tries to get out of her chair, but Aunt Despina puts a hand on her arm and gently pushes her back in her chair. No, sweetie, stay here with us. I want to hear about those college boys. How's the fresh crop looking this year? Any of them look like that, uh... Tom Cruise? Vespina, you're too old for college boys. Then how about the professors? 
Any interesting ones? There's this one teacher guy who's kind of cool. He seems to have taken an interest in me. Ooh, what does he look like? Um, Asian, Korean, maybe, or Chinese. Oh. Any Robert Redford's? Robert Redford's? Sylvester Stallone's? Or how about Mr. T? What? There'll be no Mr. T at my table. Oh, come on. We could use a little flavor at the table. Mr. T. Mr. T. I saw that fight. He does not speak the proper English. I will not have it. It was a movie, Dad. It wasn't real. The Rocky. He's real. He punches hard. Uncle Nico takes a boxer stand and throws some air punches, getting himself excited. Calm down, my fighting boy. <laughs> I could have been a champion. A contender. A contender, Uncle. Well, anyway, Stacy, you let the cousins go to their room and get to know each other. You stay with us and help us clean the table before we do dishes. Dishes? I don't really do dishes. The whole table stops and gasps. <gasps> That's all right, dear. You just stay here and sit. We want to find out. All about you. Everyone leans into Stacy, making her squirm in her seat. Aristotle shakes his head, resigned to the awkwardness. Come on, cousin. I'll show you my room. Aristotle leads Constantine up the flight of steps. Aristotle's room, day. Aristotle leads Constantine into his bedroom. Posters from the, 19, from the 1980s, like Heather Thomas, quarterback Joe Montana, and Al Pacino from The Godfather hang on the walls. Constantine approaches the poster of Joe Montana. Wow. Wow. He looks, he looks very confident. confident. Is this an actor? That's Joe Montana. What movies has he been in? He's a football player, all pro for the 49ers. The cat, I, I just love him. I, I love excellence in anything. Of course. He's great. The catcher. He, he's a quarterback, cousin, in football. And by the time he's done, he might be the greatest of all time. Aristotle grabs a football off his bureau and starts tossing it to himself. But don't mention Montana to these morons around here. These New England Patriot fans can't stand them, but they're just jealous. See, their team will never amount to anything. Constantine, meanwhile, has discovered a worn copy of the 1982 Heather Thomas bikini poster on the wall. Of course. And her? Do you know her? Know her? Of course. I fucked her. Really? Does Stacy know? <laughs> You're crazy, man. That's Heather Thomas. She's on TV. The Fall Guy. You watch it, right? I haven't seen it. Constantine passes by a poster with the animated face of 80s icon Max Headroom and does a double take on it. You don't have an American TV on that military base? Yeah, kind of. My, my mom, she didn't really want me to watch much. But you did anyway, cousin? Well, not that she went to sleep. I would watch, but mostly movies on late night TV. And let's, um, Jose, let me, let's go back to your, uh, your Constantine voice, but just, just taper it back like 25 or 30 percent. You know what I mean? Certainly. Okay, thank you. Constantine approaches Aristotle's Godfather Part 2 poster. Keep your friends close, your enemies closer. Hey, that was great, cousin. You do an outstanding Michael. It's my favorite movie. I'd live in it if I could. No, you wouldn't. Yes, I would. Really? No, Tom. Just listen. All my people are businessmen. Their loyalty is based on that. One thing I learned from my father is to try to think as the people around you think. And on that basis, anything is possible. Yes, anything is possible. That's why my man called me. You ever run an angle? 
In math class? Not in class. Not with the ruler. A scam? An angle, you know? A service. A, a scam? Isn't that uh, immoral? Ill illegal? Forget it then. We'll go back to the family like good boys. Aristotle turns to leave the room. Constantine grabs him by the arm, firm. No, no, wait. Aristotle, Aristotle tries to shake the grip, but he cannot. You tell me. Aristotle makes deep eye contact. Okay, but you let go. You tell me first. I think it's freezing up. You let, oh, my bad. Oh, you let good. go first. Tell me. They make deep eye contact, neither giving an inch. Finally, Aristotle speaks. Okay, well, tell your hand to let the fuck go of me, okay? Okay. Okay. Aristotle tries to escape, but Constantine increases his grip. But you tell me first. Housing. Constantine squeezes even harder. Government housing. That's the angle. Finally, Constantine lets go. Aristotle rubs his own arm to get the feeling back into it. You're not going to tell now, are you? Who would I tell? You're my blood, aren't you? Our fathers are brothers, and thus we are like brothers. Whatever is spoken between us stays between these walls. With your football man and your bikini girl, right? Aristotle just looks at him. Spoken like a true gangster. No. How does this scam work? It's not a scam, it's a service. You get that through your head, cousin. Yes. A service. Very good. Exterior, interior, low-income neighborhoods, day, night, montage. A sequence of supporting footage to illustrate what Aristotle is speaking of. The visual montage could possibly consist of stock footage, newspaper clips, and or animations. The state of Massachusetts has certain distressed and abandoned properties on a red list they are looking to take over. The landlords or owners of these properties are way behind on our repairs and they don't have the money to get them up to standards. Now, rather than help the landlords out or give them grants or funds to make the repairs, the federal government and the Committee for Urban Renewal plans to offer the owners a low but respectable sum to buy them. Straight. So what? That's the government, not us. Ah, but this is where we can get involved. Before the government can obtain these distressed and abandoned properties, we do. We insert flash forward montage of Aristotle and Constantine hustling through the low income housing projects, wheeling and dealing to match the below dialogue. Yes, that way, when the assigned make offers on these properties, they find out they have to pay just a little more than nothing because of the most recent turn of ownership, just a little something to make it worth their effort. So, but won't the feds get suspicious of all the new ownerships from the same guys just as they plan to purchase? Insert footage of government desk worker as desk, struggling through heaps of manila folders and papers. There was so much paperwork and red tape in these government agencies, one hand doesn't know when the other is washed. And there would be a different power, I'm sorry, there would be a different owner of sorts present on each property. Back to the boys in Aristotle's room. I think good head. Right. Puppets that we control. Correct. Next problem. We need to know which properties are on the list. We need to play the guessing game of what properties the feds are looking to buy. We'd need to make that detailed spreadsheet of some kind to maximize our efforts and make our work efficient. We'd need to make sure we had information, plenty of information, but only the right information. 
As Constantine speaks, Aristotle smiles and slides open his sock drawer. He moves some stuff around and then pulls out a file. He hands it to Constantine. Open it. Go ahead. Constantine does. He flips through its contents. How did you... This is the red list of the stressed and abandoned properties. The official list. The exact same one. Whose handwriting is this? Some things I must keep to myself. Family business. I am a family. The inner family. Constantine grabs Aristotle around the collar. You will tell me now. Aristotle whacks his hand away. All right, all right. Temper, temper, cousin. Your Aunt Sophia, my mother, she has access. She works for the committee of urban renewal. Your mother is in on it? Insert flashback sequence below to match the events as Aristotle describes. I happen to find this list on her desk after I happen to hear her and father discussing this one night. So the handwriting is yours. Back to the boys in the room. Elementary, my dear Constantine. Elementary, my dear Constantine. So you're. <laughs> so you're going to do this the right under her nose and risk her job in her safety? Giving up insider knowledge like this, she could go to jail, I would think. Insert flash forward footage to match the events Aristotle describes. I won't actually be the owner of any. Of the property. We'll get the other people to sign the papers, but we'll be the ones in control. We'll supply the initial investment money and set it all up. But we'll have associates. Potsies. Puppets. To actually sign the papers, and, and we'll be the ones. Back to the boys in the room. Pulling the strings. Yes, my cousin. And how many times have you done this up to now? I'm working on my first score. When? And I can make my first sell to the feds and take it from there. When? It's tough to say. Could be a few months, could be six, could be a year. Constantine paces. He grabs a pillow off Aristotle's bed and slams it to the ground. Damn it, I'll do it. Do what? Drop out. Just for now. Get my money back from the school. Just for the semester. Or two, if it takes so. No, you can't do that. The family will kill me if they find out you dropped out to support my little entrepreneurship plan. What are you going to do? Nice college boy. Didn't want to get mixed up in the family business. Ha, <laughs> ha, no, I'm Michael. I'm always Michael. No matter what I say, I'm always Michael. Sonny, sorry. No, I'm Michael. I'm always Michael. No matter what I say, I'm always Michael. Aristotle takes Constantine's ring finger and plays, off, plays as if kissing a ring. Michael, one day I shall call you Godfather. Aristotle reaches into his pocket and pulls out a keychain. He removes a key from it and hands it to Constantine. Take this key to the house if you ever need it. Constantine pokes the key into the air while speaking to accentuate his following words. I'll make him an offer he can't refuse. Exterior, campus courtyard day. Constantine walks through the... Hey, just we're having a little trouble with uh, Aristotle's uh, connection. I don't know if there's like... Maybe you can move in your home or wherever yeah. you are. Maybe there's a different uh, room. Just, just something to think about because you're, you're, you're doing a good job with the acting. It's just the connection is kind of okay. chopping it up a little bit. Yeah, it does that. There's, there's like some big like winter storms going on. I don't know. Oh, I see. To do gotcha. It, but, it um, probably does. Yeah. Okay. okay. You want to read for it, and um, we'll stick with him for now. If it gets worse, don't take it personally. Uh, no, no, no. no make a switch. Uh, exterior campus courtyard day. Constantine walks through the campus courtyard. You know, you know what? I'm going to do that because it's getting a little choppy. Let me have a. Uh...
<laughs> is it, is it Scott? S Scott? Yeah. Let me, Scott, you're going to jump in for um, you're going to jump in for the rest for Aristotle for a while. Okay. What um, what page is it? We're on it was, sixty-seven uh, now. Sixty-seven. Uh, yeah. Was... Peter, you're doing a great job. It's just it's it's getting so choppy. It's hard to hear it. Um, so we're on sixty-seven campus courtyard day. Constantine walks through the campus courtyard as students chat with each other in small groups in the background. From a distance behind him, Professor Cho observes. And that's how it got started. Our little business. I called it the MC Exchange. Oh, no, no, that's Constantine. That's Constantine. Oh, am I Aristotle? You're Aristotle. I might have, I might have misspoke, but ADD. you're Aristotle. Constantine. ADD, I'm sorry. No problem. <laughs> Constantine walks through the campus courtyard as students chat with each other in small groups in the background. From a distance behind him, Professor Cho observes. And that's how it got started. Our little business. I called it the MC Exchange, but we didn't have an official name. Nothing official on a paper. I dropped out of school officially, didn't see the use for it. We were getting the girls, we were getting the money. Why else would I need to be in school anyway? But Aristotle, we kept him enrolled, not doing great in his classes, but enough for him to get by. We made sure of it. We needed him on campus, keeping up the front for the MC exchange and scouting puppets and patsies. Me, I was more hands-on to our business. I became the backbone, the foundation. You might even say I became just like- Aristotle answers. Michael, the godfather. I got some good news. What's that is? Remember Stacy? Your girl? Well, not really, but sort of. What about her? She joined a sorority. Smart girls, but crazy. These chicks love speed, and they love coke. Oh, we can help them out there. Good score. And they love cock. Good score indeed. They will get their coke, they will get their speed, and if they're lucky, uh, they will get their cock. But make them pay. Always make them pay. What time are you meeting these girls? 7 p.m. at the Tri Pie House. Hmm. Get a hold of Stacy and tell her you want her to meet you in the fifth floor of the library at 5 p.m. tonight, two hours before you go to the sorority house. Flash forward to scenes of the library matching Constantine's words below. Sit in the professor's lounge on the fifth floor, that section nobody ever sits in. Let her talk about the self and all the girls in the sorority and find out all about them. Professor Cho appears in the shadows of the professor's lounge. I'm supposed to take notes? No, you appear casual. You're just listening to her talk like a good boyfriend would. At 6.30 p.m., I'll be at the front steps of the library to meet you both. The three of us will then walk over to the sorority house. But that's only a five-minute walk. Perfect. We'll send Stacy in there first, and we'll bide our time outside. We'll tell her we have family business to discuss. That leaves us alone for 25 minutes, and you can fill me in on the tripe girls. I understand it's one of the most exclusive sororities in the country. Real debutante bitches. I want to know about them, their families, their secrets, their weaknesses, their money. Because when we get inside, I want to know which ones to play hard and how. Evil, cousin. Evil. Michael. Yes, Michael. Aristotle checks his watch. I've got one more class before tonight. Then get to it. Tonight we have business. Yes, cousin. Michael. Michael. Aristotle runs off. Interior, MIT school store, day. Constantine enters the school store and talks to us as he tries on various MIT gear, hats, sweatshirts, etc. But you see, this was a test. I tested my cousin. I did not think, or should I say, I was a bit suspicious that he was not truly up to running his side of our business. Constantine notices Professor Cho shopping around the MIT store. Cho looks over to Constantine. Constantine looks back, and Cho pretends he wasn't looking. Constantine gives Cho a curious look, and Cho turns around at closed display and seemingly disappears as if into thin air. 
Constantine shakes this off and gets back to looking at the MIT clothes and his previous thoughts. So, I plan to do a little eavesdropping, just keeping tabs on my business associate. Exterior, library desk, establishing shot as Constantine walks towards the MIT library entrance. Interior, library elevator, night. Constantine is now smothered in a goofy display of MIT clothes, including a hat and a pair of sunglasses that effectively covers his face. All this stupid shit is my disguise, so my half-wit cousin and his girl don't recognize me. My display of school spirit to a school that didn't want me and I didn't want. Constantine pushes the button for fifth floor. Interior, library, fifth floor, night. Constantine enters and goes to the professor's lounge area. As he predicted, there was no one else in it. He sits down and lets out a deep breath. From his chair, he looks out whimsically through a window to the campus below him. By 4 p.m., I had myself planted, just waiting for my cousin and his lady friend. I sat. I waited. I wanted to hear what I would hear. You know, it's funny. That hour that I waited was among the most peaceful times I ever had in my life. Special effects, time lapse. Constantine continues to peacefully meditate, looking out the window as a clock behind him advances to 5 p.m. Finally, Constantine's trance is interrupted as Aristotle and Stacy enter the floor with their banter. Wow, I haven't been here since, like, freshman orientation. All these books, what are we supposed to do with them? Read them, you fool. This is MIT, remember? Ah, uh, yes. Now I remember. Please, Stacy, take a seat. Aristotle leads Stacy to a table. Neither of them notice Constantine. He goes to pull out a seat for her. She gives this a double take. What are you doing? Uh, being a gentleman. It's 1986. A woman ran for vice president a few years ago. Yeah, and you see how that turned out. One day, a woman will be president. In this country? A black man would be more likely to be elected president than a woman. And in my family, if I didn't pull out your chair, my mother would cut my head off. Okay, well, don't pull your macho stuff tonight with my sisters. Ah, uh, yes. Yeah, sorority sisters. Tell me more about them. Who do you think will be our best customers? Denise has got a real problem. Total dependency issues. We could probably get her hooked. And, well, some of the girls with good grades, they don't sleep. They don't sleep well? They don't sleep. Like, ever. So, some of the uppers might work for them. From his seated position, Aristotle notices Professor Cho lurking around in the background, as if Cho himself is also eavesdropping on Aristotle and Stacy. Back to Stacy. Stacy, uh. Now let me ask you. That's what's on page 73. Sorry. Um, I don't sleep like ever. What do you want? A cut, a piece of the action? Do I have the right script here? Um, okay. Yeah, I think you do. Yeah, it's the, the, the line before what do you want? It's the. Now let me ask you a question. I, I, I might have changed a little something. Why so, don't I have that? Okay, this I'll just say it, and then I'll, I'll chime you back in. So Stacey says, now let me ask you, what's in this for me, for giving you all this insider information? Well, what do you want? Stacy says, a cut, a piece of a the cut, action. A piece of the action, got it, okay. How, how big a piece? A half. You know I already have a partner, my cousin. He would kill me. Is he your partner? Or your boss. Hey, look. We can call this whole thing off. But then there's a lot of money to be made off these girls. Yeah, but I wasn't expecting to give you a piece. Give a piece? Get a piece? Understand? Aristotle looks over. Aristotle looks her over as she gets up out of her chair and comes over to him. Well, maybe. Just, just this one time. Stacy straddles him in his chair, wraps her arm around his neck, and pulls his hair back tight. You don't have to get clearance for your cousin for this, do you? 
From his seat, unseen by them, Constantine cringes. He again notices Professor Cho lurking in the shadows, who again disappears as quickly as he appears. Stacy and Aristotle, not noticing either Constantine or Professor Cho, have sex right in the middle of the library. From his seat, Constantine looks on in morbid curiosity. So, this was unusual. <laughs> Stuck there, listening to my cousin. Fuck this girl, this whore, trying to infiltrate my business. I didn't like it, yet I was impressed. <laughs> I admit, <laughs> turned on. The balls on this bitch. Certainly she was something, but a friend or foe. I hadn't decided. Exterior, college courtyard night. Constantine, now with his MIT disguise, Aristotle and Stacy walk together towards the Tripi house. They see the sorority house in the background as they get closer to it. Okay, when we get in there, you two do most of the talking. And what are you going to do? Uh, that's your line, Constantine. Uh, on my script, it's the listening oh, period. Yeah, that's, and that's, then, that's the dialogue, yeah. He said, she says, and what are you going to do? And he says, the listening. listening. Okay. Yeah, I did. I said that. Oh, yeah. I hear it. Okay. I yeah. dropped out. Constantine hears footage from behind him. Suspicious of the noise, Constantine looks over his shoulder to see Professor Cho, now seated behind them on a bench, looking at him, but pretending to read a book. Constantine turns his face back forward, and Aristotle notices his anxiety. Everything okay, cousin? I might have an enemy on this campus, one that has not provided either his name nor his intention. Uh, that's my Michael, always looking for a fight when there is none. Constantine looks back over to the bench. Cho is now gone. He turns his head back forward and continues to walk with the others. Michael, is that your name? I thought it was... It's out of respect. He's a family thing. My cousin thinks he's the godfather. I humor him. A man who doesn't spend time with his family can never be a real man. <laughs> Very good. I wouldn't expect as much from a college girl. Sicilian women are more dangerous than shotguns. <laughs> and you're Sicilian? I am not, but I'm dangerous. Doesn't that make, doesn't that get me a membership into your boys club? Interior, tri -pi house night, montage. Aristotle and Stacy work the room of tri -pi sorority sisters throughout the course of the evening. Constantine stays calm and collected in a corner chair with a deep, concentrated look on his face. Occasionally, a random sorority sister or two approaches Constantine, and he deals with them as they do. Over the visual montage of the sorority house evening, we advance in audio only to the post-meeting conversation between Constantine, Stacy, and Aristotle. This meeting tonight, it went well. Your girlfriends are all very accommodating and not picky. And purses full of money. Well, it's not like it's their money. It's their parents' money. Usually. <laughs> and they won't miss it. It's always easier to spend someone else's money. So, this will be a good little side business. Exterior, college courtyard night. After the tri Pi house meeting, the same conversation continues in live time as Constantine, Stacy, and Aristotle walk through the, the, through the almost pitch black campus, lit only by various lamps in the quad and a few lit buildings. But the main business, how is that? How is what? What you guys really do for the main money? Hold, hold, hold on a second. Constantine puts an arm around Aristotle and takes him aside. How well do you know this girl? Intimately. And what are you telling her? Family business? No, no, no. Constantine squeezes Aristotle hard by the ear. This bitch got a big mouth or what? Stacy comes over right into Aristotle's face. Hey, hey, get off of him. Constantine rears back a hand as if to strike her. 
Aristotle jumps in front of Stacy. Constantine's hand strikes in tension. Sh- I'm sorry. Constantine's hand shakes in tension as he has to force himself not to strike Aristotle. Constantine notices Professor Cho again in the background, observing from the distance, seemingly making notes into a notebook. From across the co- courtyard, Constantine makes deep eye contact with Cho, who does not flinch. Then Constantine lowers his hand, and after a moment of tension, he storms off alone into the night, leaving Aristotle and Stacy alone in the courtyard. You can't disrespect him like that, or ask too many questions. He totally doesn't respect you. He means well. He, he, he means... You'd be so much better off without him. Or family. Exterior, path of darkness, night. Constantine walks a path by himself. Trees and shrubbery brush against him. There's nothing I can do that can screw... A, there's nothing that can screw a man or a business up like a woman. A goddamned woman. First it was mother. Then it was this Stacy bitch. The weeks passed by. Within a few months, this tramp had built a wall between us. My cousin and I. And then it came. The gunshot. I never heard fired. Interior, Aristotle's room night. Stacy and Aristotle lay on his bed next to each other. From downstairs, noise of the family can be heard. Your family sure is a loud bunch. My parents' goodbye party before Greece. Everyone had to stop by. What can you get? What? What's that? Stick around long enough and you'll find out. Stacy looks up to all the 80s posters and memorabilia on Aristotle's walls. Your stuff? It's like you're still a kid. You know who liked my stuff too? Another girl? Constantine. Stacy sits up on the bed. Ugh, forget him. Aristotle gets up, pulls up his pants, and paces a little bit around the room. He's not so bad. He's the worst. I want to do a change just for fun. Uh, the lady in the green that did Kimmy before, uh, good job uh, with uh, Stacy. The lady in green, you did something before. Yeah, you, I, I forget your name. Was it Stacy? The lady in green. I want to have you read Stacy for uh, the rest of it, okay? Okay, good job. That's very good. Aristotle is careful to restrain himself from getting angry. Interconnect with their scene, we see Constantine continue to trudge alone on his path of darkness. The greatest enemy to my to a man is a woman. The greatest deceit. Back to Aristotle and Stacy. Family. Oikogenia. Us Greeks stick together. Come on, get dressed. Dessert must be ready by now, and I don't want us to be so obvious to my mother and father. Stacy grabs his hand. I'm I the leading green. Yeah, that's you. Yep, yep. <laughs> okay, I can't see other people. You're going to be a father, not a godfather ripoff like your cousin, a real father. The air is knocked out of Aristotle. He was genuinely confused, neither happy nor angry. He continues to hold Stacy's hand, looks at her in the eyes. What will we do? Get married. Have a child. Back to Constantine on the path of darkness. Like the first worm hit by the day's first ray of sun, squirming in its place. Back to Aristotle on the bed with Stacy. Right, of course. I'll, I'll talk to my family. We'll, we're, we're going to work it out. Exterior, Marina in Massachusetts night. The path of darkness leads Constantine to a body of water. He looks up to the night to study the moon. And who gets that first worm? Interior, Aristotle's room, night. Back to Stacy on the bed. You are happy, right? Of course I am. He kisses her in the mouth softly. I'm going to be a father. What good genia? Exterior, Marina in Massachusetts, night. Back to Constantine. We applaud the early bird for the getting the worm. But what about the early worm? He's just as dead. Constantine approaches a dock. There are various boats, but no people around. Do you know how a boat gets ruined? Rotting from the bottom? You see this on poorly made wooden boats, owned by novices. A singular soft spot in the wood can lead to so much damage. The water seeps in, as it does, from that one soft spot, and then it spreads, corrodes the integrity of the ship. 
and then it sinks and everyone drowns and nobody knows what happened because nobody paid attention. Interior, doctor's waiting room day. Constantine sits in the waiting room alone in a chair. He looks up to the counter where Aristotle and Stacy check themselves in. The couple does not see Constantine. Constantine looks up as a nurse takes Aristotle and Stacy into the doctor's office. Interior, doctor's office day. Aristotle and Stacy wait in the doctor's office. Stacy is a bit annoyed. I think we should have gone to my doctor for these tests, Aristotle. This guy's really old. Dr. Brown has been my doctor since I was a kid. He'll do fine. The door opens and Dr. Brown, a goofy, joke-making, old-fashioned type of doctor, 70s, enters as if somehow overhearing their conversation through the closed door. Dr. Brown comes in and oddly pats Stacy on her stomach, much to her chagrin. Now, don't you kids worry. I've helped many a bread come out of the oven, Mr. and Mrs. Whoa. Not quite there yet, Doc. Just one step at a time. We're getting married real soon, Dr. Brown. Of, uh, of course. And a fine pick of the litter for you, Aerosol. Aristotle. That's right. Aristotle's been coming to me since he was just a boy. Ten years old. Six. That's right. Six. You kids grow up so soon these days, and then you have your own kids. I can't keep up with this. This was a bit of a surprise. You see, we were in the school library, and... Not all. That's enough. The doctor doesn't want those details. A doctor is like a bartender, young lady. We're just here to mix the drinks. No judgments. None of my business anyway. But if you want my opinion, it's always best for the child to come from a two-parent home. My son will have plenty of love at home, Doctor. As soon as my parents come home from their vacation in Greece, I'm going to tell them. And this whole extended family, aunts and uncles, cousins, everything. Stacy cringes a bit as Aristotle says cousins. We're having an addition to the family. Actually, two. My wife and my son. Oikogenia! For your daughter, because I have this instinct. She's a girl. Well, how is he? She? Doctor? Doctor? Well, as far as... Well, uh, the from, let me just jump in. Someone's like kind of chomping away on lunch or something. <laughs> if we get a, a mute. That doesn't sound off. <laughs> it might, it might, it might be good. Bonnie was kind of moving around a little bit. It might be her. But <laughs> someone, someone's having like Fritos or something. Or like uh, celery. Yeah, just just, uh, just self mute everybody if you're gonna chomp out. It was I, I'm me. Almost, I don't, I'm, no no uh, no judgments. Uh, let's go back to uh, Doctor Brown. Well, as far as all the latest technology can tell. Okay. Yeah. Well, as far as all the latest technology can tell, I don't see anything wrong with this young man. Young man? Young man? So he is a him? He is. Oh. Aristotle offers the doctor a celebratory high five who accepts it with glee. Yes. <laughs> I really wanted a little girl. Perhaps next time, just make sure, you know, you, you get that ring first. No time like the present. Dr. Brown exits, leaving the parents to be by themselves. Yes, a boy. To carry on the family tradition, the legacy, the name. I'm the first of my generation in the family to have a son. Very good, son. Just don't forget the little lady that helped make it happen. That's right, my mother. She'll be so happy when I tell her the good news. Oh. Aristotle goes into planning mode with a commitment he's never displayed before. All right. My parents will be in Greece for five more days. I'm going to drop you off tonight at MT MIT. I want you to get all your stuff out of the tri -pie house and move in with me this weekend. In the meantime, I'll go back home, clean up my room, make it, more look, make it look more comfortable for the both of us. I'll switch out my bed with the bigger bed that's in the guest room. I'll also call all the aunts and uncles and invite everybody over for a big welcome home party for my parents when they get back next Tuesday. Now, 
at the party, we're going to make two big announcements. We're getting married, and I'm having a son. Ecogenia. Interior, doctor's waiting room, day. Constantine and Stacy enter from the office back into the waiting room with big smiles, never seeing Constantine. Constantine watches them exit stoically, then addresses us. So, here it is. At a young age, I am my cousin. He's a f so, what does that make me? Air interior, Aristotle's room, night. Constantine sits on Aristotle's bed, looking around to the posters of Heather Thomas, Joe Montana, and Max Headroom. The house is unusually quiet. Finally, Constantine hears the front, doors, front door open and close with a thud, followed by rapid steps up the stairs. The door opens and Aristotle enters, shocked to see Constantine waiting. How did you get in? You once gave me a key. Remember? When we were doing business not too long ago. Aristotle begins to clean up his room, tossing his dirty laundry into a bag as he continues the conversation. That, that's right. I'm sorry I haven't been in touch, cousin. Michael. No, today it's cousin. Not business, pleasure, family, oikogenia. The house is empty. Where is everyone? My parents are in Greece. I have the place to myself. I'm moving Stacy in. I see. Aristotle sits next to Constantine on the bed. Our biggest hopes realized. I'm having... We're having a boy. The firstborn son of the next generation. Um... Uh. Hmm, you beat me to the punch. Perhaps you can name this little creation after his godfather. Constantine. Michael. Perhaps. Perhaps, Michael. As a middle name. These Greek names we carry have the kind of worn themselves out. But there's one I like that I think will be perfect for my son. My son with a combination of my own and Stacy's good looks. Adonis. I think my son will be an Adonis. Perhaps let him be born first and see if he earns that name. No, cousin. Michael. That's not how it works. You don't have the kid first and then make him earn the name. You give him the name and just hope he earns it. Mm. Getting without earning. Like a father. Like son. Constantine gets up to exit the room. Congratulations to you and your woman. Aristotle grabs Constantine by the shoulder. Come on. Aren't you happy for me? You've been negligent with your work. Work? The scams? We have to grow out of that. I'm having a family. We've missed out on a lot of opportunities for growth. You cannot be serious. You'd know if I were paying attention to business, not to pleasure. You'd know if you were paying attention to business, not to pleasure. Pleasure? Business? This is my life, man. Michael. Cut the Godfather crap. This was a movie. This is our real lives. I spent my whole life not trying to be careless. Women and children can afford to be careless, but not men. And what's careless? You. I can see why your father left you, and your mother raised you like a veal, a caged child on that miserable military base, the baby, the baby brat. My father died. They told you he did. What do you know? A terse moment. Aristotle will not answer him. Constantine exits. He slams the door. Aristotle hears Constantine's steps go down the staircase from outside his room. Aristotle goes to his desk in his room that's cluttered with books and knickknacks. He pushes some stuff over to uncover the old school rotary phone on his desk. 
Interior, staircase, night. Constantine goes down a few steps, then he stops. A brutal calm crosses over his face. Interior, Aristotle's room, night. Aristotle picks up his phone and uses the spin wheel to dial several numbers. The other line picks up. Stacy voices answers. Hey, this is Stacy. What's up? Hey, Stacy, it's me. You were right about my cousin. He's a freak. He was waiting for me when I got home and... Aristotle looks down. His own shirt now seeps blood. His own. Constantine enters the room again. A gun in his hand. Silencer attached. Aristotle drops to the floor on his back, grasping the wound in his body with one hand, the phone with the other. Constantine walks over and stands above his bleeding cousin. In Aristotle's hand, the voice of Stacy is heard from the phone receiver. Yep, it's Stacy, all right. But guess what, silly? You've reached my new voice answering machine. I just got it. This is not really me. I'm not really here. So this is just recording of me. So what you want to do is leave your name and number after the beep, and I'll call you back ASAP. Love you all. The phone goes dead. Constantine looks down to Aristotle. What do you know? What do you know? That my poor cousin was so overwhelmed with the prospect of being a father at such a young age that he called the whore mother of his bastard son to say goodbye before he took his own life. But well, she didn't have the decency to pick up the phone. Aristotle now fully realizes the gunshot he suffered was no bizarre accident. My son. My Adonis. To black screen with an Aristotle voiceover. They say when you die, you see your life flash before your eyes. Only 20 years. But I didn't see that 20 years I had lived past before me. I saw the 64 years that I should have lived, that I would have lived, past before me. A wife, a child, a family, a life. Back to the room. Constantine takes to one knee beside Aristotle. The wood floor now seeps in Aristotle's blood. Look out for my girl and my son, cousin. Michael. Please, Constantine. Cousin. Connie. As if they were my own. Aristotle dies. Constantine waits for the last life, for the last of life to fully leave Aristotle. Then Constantine wipes off his own fingerprints from his gun with his shirt and places the gun in Aristotle's own empty hand, leaving the other hand with the phone in it. Constantine looks up to us. Steel eyes reflect no remorse. Fade to black. Text on stream. To be continued in The Last Betrayal. Fade to back to close-up on Constantine's face in the room. Everybody's got the story. This one is mine. Fade out. The end. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. I know that that was a uh, quote. Thank you. Thanks thank very you. much. Great. Some great thank you. reads with this. Great job. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. Let me order a pizza for Aristotle. Yeah. If I could order you guys a cyber pizza, we would. <laughs> a, a cyber Greek pizza. Uh, Arthur, do you have any? Uh, we want to get people's feedback, but uh, Arthur, you have anything you want to say to anybody? I just want to say thank you. That was beautiful. Uh, especially thank you, Jose, for uh, hanging in there the whole time, man. Yep. And, um, everybody, I mean, everybody did awesome. It was, uh, yeah. it was good for me to just, like, sit back and listen, you know, because even though, like, some of the words were mispronounced and all that stuff, it, it's, it's, it's kind of the ethnic factor that's going to be in there. But um, it was good enough. It wasn't like an audition or anything. I don't want people to feel like they, you know, when, when we change characters and stuff, uh, it's not. It's nothing personal. We just want to hear uh, other voices and stuff. So don't. It's not. You know, don't be self-conscious about that stuff. And, and a lot of times that was for technical reasons too. Everybody, just so you know that, because um, because when people get a little choppy, like Peter got choppy. But he was doing a good job. So sometimes it's just that. And, and like Arthur said, some people I have never heard act before, really. So I wanted to just hear different voices. Um, does anyone have any? Um, and uh, some of the people that are new to me, especially, maybe got a little short changed on reading parts. 
So I do thank people that were patient if they didn't get more parts or, or more time. Um, does anyone have any uh, thoughts they want to share, comments? Uh, we, we, we encourage them because we want the script to get better. This was not to... Uh, this was a the, the purpose of this is to help the script. So so we we want people to have comments heard about the script. Well, um, can, oh, go ahead. I can say one thing. I wasn't Please. quite I wasn't quite clear about the role of the professor too. Yep. And what purpose he served to the story. Yep, that's a great point. And I can address that. Um, we're kind of he he Professor Chu will be coming in more in this the second one we think yeah so the, he's kind of a what I would call a, a hanging uh, a, a hanging thread meaning that we're leaving him and his development more for the store the second one and there is some uh, hints that he is kind of observing these students because he might be uh, spying on them. He might spy in a sense that he knows what they're up to. He's taking an interest in these students and their scams. So he would come more into play in the second one, in the sequel. Yeah, I just didn't, I wasn't quite sure that he, as it's written now. Well, we, we needed him to be let, her, let her finish, let her finish. Go ahead, go ahead, Bonnie. Yeah, I just wasn't sure he served the story well enough, you know. Yeah. For you guys to keep him, you know, it, as he's currently there. That, yeah. That's that's just me. No, that's a good, that's a good point. That's a good point. And that, was it Bob that was starting to say something before? Uh, no. Somebody uh, else was uh, speaking. Go ahead, uh, Giovanni. Yeah. Go ahead, Giovanni. Um, so it, it when you sent me the scripts, um, I don't know, two weeks ago, whatever. Um, I read maybe the first few pages and the military aspect and all that. And so I was like, oh, well, this should be interesting. It's a military story. And then, of course, today I realized it goes in a total different direction. I didn't even expect. Um, but um, but I was just wondering about that aspect of it. Is that like it, it kind of revealed at the end that the father left um, left uh, Connie. Uh, Constantine, so uh, left the family, but um, but I mean, is anything going to come back in the second one? We got in military, or maybe added to this one. I I, I think what I, uh, Arthur, if you want to, you seem to chomp at the bit. Go ahead, Arthur. Well, um, yeah, that that's a good. That's kind of the underlying theme because you find out in the middle when he meets the family, the Greek family in America. He, he, they, they kind of keep it hushed because there might be some controversy or some kind of secret that they don't want to reveal or they may not even know. So they're trying to feel him out. They're trying to feel Constantine out. So then, and obviously, uh, Hanish at the beginning is like, I have a, a bad dream. Like there's something bad's going to happen to you, like a plane crash or something. So she's like very glum in the situation she's like you're gonna get in a plane like how nice of her to say that you know so but uh, you know that that's an underlying theme throughout the whole thing and then at the end of course she's like that's what they told you so in other words it is a, it's the it, it's very important to the theme uh and it does have something to do with the military but i i don't want to you know th this is going to be like we, I originally wrote it as three different movies, but I, in my mind, but um, we're going to make it two, and it's going to be um, like backwards, like it's sort of like Constantine as an adult looking back. These are like, you know, flashbacks, basically, of everything. So, and it, and it kind of parallels my personal uh, timeline when I was born. I was born in, in the 60s. And you know, and we went to like when I was in college. And so it's not my life. It's not a, you know, a story of my life, but it's a culmination of various, um, you know, of relatives. Like my uncle was a, an officer in the Greek army and, you know, and he kind of traveled all over the world. And it's sort of like it, some truth to it, but not, not much. Right. 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 The, the okay. idea I think would be that, um, 
the the lie that this kid Constantine grows up with that he doesn't have a father because his father's dead, and then it tears him apart at the end when he finds out from his cousin that his father may not have been dead the whole time. Uh, I I would I would say objectively it's more that Aristos left the mother Hanish as opposed to leaving the infant child, although the infant child was a victim of it. Um, so that I think would come into play in a second that we would see what, why did Aristos leave? Where did he go? And how does Constantine reconcile with the fact that his father's not actually dead, but he, he had a, a second life that was, that he, the son was not a part of. So, so that I think would be a huge thing for the second one. Or he's doing a top secret military thing and something, you know, happen right All right okay uh author yes uh i i i just felt like there was too many referencing of hollywood movies and actors and using the godfather as a referencing i just didn't know where it was taking me for a while so it wasn't holding my attention so i didn't understand all that dialogue as to why are we going there? You know, what is the, what was, what was the point? Instead of just sticking with uh, the, the bulk of the of, of the plot, you know, because that's what I. So that that's a section that I thought was, I can't give you specifics because there was a lot of stuff in there. But uh, apparently, I'm learning it was based loosely on your life. Correct the, the story. Very Am I correct. <laughs> yeah. Yes, but um, okay. well. Okay. I just want to say um, the, the underlying thing too of that of his life is he wants to be he falls in love with the actress and Milda, and he wants to be an actor. He he loves movies and he loves The Godfather. He becomes immersed in it, so he believes now that he's Michael. He believes that fantasy. So that's another. That, that's that's about Constantine. This is like he's he's diabolical. He's crazy. He killed his his cousin. You know, mm. so, I mean, the guy's fucking nuts. So <laughs> I'm not, I mean, I'm a little nuts, but I'm not going to fucking kill my cousin. But uh, I'm just Nobody saying, ever thought that I way. The reference to the movies are very, okay. as, you know, he wants to be an actor. He wants to do something other than mathematics or just wants to get yeah. out. He starts to mix the fantasy of those movies into in his own life because he's, he's led a very sheltered, like controlling life in the farm. Okay. A lot okay. of hate. Where are you? Hello. There you go. We're back. Yeah. Yeah. And there we go. I just felt that it could be, from what I could read of it and take it, um, a little more like condensed, oh. or or not as wordy as it seemed to be, and because you know there's always that protagonist antagonist right. thing there. And I just, I, I, being a movie buff as I am, I have a lot of love for just doing, um, you know, point of view shots and getting to know people, not that much dialogue, you know, keeping it to a minimum, you know, whereas cause it's a visual thing. And, uh, and um, just as a quick, maybe not be the proper thing, but I was watching a little bit of Ma Rainey's Black Bottom on on TV, and it had um, what's your name, Viola Davis and Chadwick Boseman, wonderful cast, but there was so much dialogue that it just, you know, it, it, it kind of took me away from from that, and I wasn't paying attention. So that's just it was me. a play. Yeah. Huh? This this was originally written as a stage play too, so it's. I uh, yeah, I, I get a feeling it. I get a sense of that, the way it was written, and because it had that feel of it, Arthur, you know. Yeah, I get so, that. Uh, that's just me. I mean, I could be totally wrong here, but I'm just giving you the impressions that I have on that. So. I could give you a different perspective, though, which is Arthur. I think it really, it could be, if depending on how how it's played, it could be the the way that we see his. Um, personality evolving into some uh, detached from reality that he 
so I did, mm -hmm. I personally had a little different take on it than the person who just spoke. I don't remember his well, name. Well, yeah, well, yeah. yeah, but I, I, I kind of, you know, I could see something that Constantine really wanted in his life and didn't have the wherewithal, the resolve within him, himself to actually make it happen. He conformed to the mother's expectations about math. And then, you know, he's easily swayed by his cousin into this crime. And, but he, he hasn't, he's got not connected to reality and therefore he wants to be called Michael all the time, you know? Mm -hmm. And so that felt to me like a glimpse into how his personality was sort of decompensating, you know, and losing touch with reality. That's intentional. I had uh, a few things I'd like to add as well, if, if I may. Um, Please. Has anybody seen the movie um, The Place Beyond the Pines? With yeah, Flying it's Gosling? a great movie. Yeah, I like that yeah. movie a lot. So this reminded me a little bit of that because it, uh, if you remember of The Place Beyond the Pines, Beyond the Pines, it had like, I don't think it was set up like three segments, but it felt like three different segments of the film. Right, Ryan Gosling, the little carnival stunt rider, rider who got a girl pregnant, the wrong, and then him uh, being a bad boy who was involved in robbing banks at the same time, right, and then him trying to run, and then uh, the bank robbery situation, and the police officer that shot him and killed him, and then the third sequence, which I'm escaping, I think it might be the the child that grew up, um, the fatherless right. child that grew up. This yeah. kind of had this similar thing in that it was young Constantine's um, growing up, losing his father and his mom, Hanish, and the military base and him finding love and discovering acting and he wanted to be a Hollywood actor. And then it also uh, became another segment, which was... Constantine going to college and um, in a way, in a way, pursuing, way, way. Uh, that was weird. Uh, weird. It just repeated itself. It repeated itself. Um, um, in a way, him starting to pursue to becoming Michael Corleone, Corleone, but it was a little confusing, was a little confusing because, because I think he was, I think in, love he was with, in love with initially being, initially a, becoming, being a, an becoming an actor. And the movie, and the, the, Godfather. Movie, the Godfather. Then I was a little, confused, was a little that confused. Maybe that he fell maybe in love with the fact that, fact that he liked this he liked idea this of idea being a gangster, a gangster, like Michael Corleone. Michael Corleone. Because then, because then throughout the rest, throughout of, the the film, rest of the film, was demanding that he would be called Michael, Michael instead of his name, name. Or even if it weren't saying his name, it was like cousin. Cousin, no, call, no, me call me Michael. I, I didn't call I, you a name. Call you a name. Cousin. Cousin. Still be. You can still be Michael. Still be Michael. Um, yeah. um, if it's a weird echo on her. Yeah, I don't know what yeah, it is. I don't know what it is. I'm doing that. It's messing me up. It's messing me up. Does anybody have anything on or? All right, it's gone now. Okay, good. I muted you for a second, and then I muted Arthur, and I'll unmute Arthur if I can. Oh. Well, I want to unmute Jose. I'm hearing right, you. I'm hearing you myself. Unmute Jose. Unmute Jose. I'm. I'm. I, 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 Jose, unmute Jose, yourself. Jose, unmute yourself. Jose, unmute yourself. Jose. Hold on. I don't think he he can unmute himself if. I'm, uh, I'm trying. I'm trying to unmute Jose because it. I was wondering if there was a. All right, Just a lot of people are sending in feedback. I'm trying to unmute Jose here. He was saying good stuff, but the the thing was. So Arthur, what's next for you? For you, like with the script. Like with the script. With the script. Yeah. Yeah. Uh. It's, <laughs> This is the initial uh, read, of course, because, like I said, we read, we wrote it as a stage play originally. But okay. the next okay. step will be to like now. Obviously, we're getting feedback, um, and, and and try to like 
like, like Mike did earlier to improve the script. Now I'm getting all these little messages of people. Right, 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 right. Um, yeah, it, it, uh, again, we're, it's the very early stages. We're trying to get it, you know, pitched yeah. to, to producers and, and people that show an interest, but we, we really want to see, uh, you know, what the people involved here, mm -hmm. uh, and their feedback and their, and, uh, what I, I, a lot of people have read it and, you know, they'll, it's, it's very hard to send it to your friends and, and then mm. have them critique it. So it's this is not what we want. We we want it, you know, real actors, real people, industry professionals to look at it, and um, and and oh. bring it to oh. another level. You know. Good luck with it. Good I, luck with it. I I went through. I that, went through that. Uh, uh, you're yeah, having feedback. Having feedback my, own feedback boys. my own boys. I think Mike remembers. Yeah. This yeah. 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 Mike. Mike. Um. Um. I'm having feedback on myself. I don't know what I'm I think maybe we'll call it a wrap. It's getting crazy. It's getting crazy. It's getting crazy. We, 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 I didn't want to get, maybe we'll do a follow up video with people to do feedback. Arthur, good luck. Arthur, good luck. Thank you. You too, Mike. We'll be fine. Mike is, you know, we're. We're partners here. We co-wrote it. So. I know. Yeah. I know. Yeah. yeah. So, Jose, I love Jose, you. I love you. Fine. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Nice work, Jose. Nice work, Jose. Scott, I'm trying to get to to everybody. Great job, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, everybody. I like the Scott. Nice work, Nish. Uh, no. Thanks to all the actors. The actors did great. Did great. Awesome. We have a lousy connection here, so I want to spare you the thing. But thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody. And uh, we'll probably do a follow-up video. We'll talk about it. Yeah. 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 Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Connections. Take care, everyone. Mike Mancier. Mike Mancier. Thank you. Thank you. Arthur Hugh, the first. Arthur Hugh, the first.